Brian, are you? There we go. Good morning and welcome. We're going to uh, give a, another minute or two for folks to gather and then we will start up with this amazing panel. Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, Denton Smart Cities and Connected Communities Think Tank is really honored to um, be co-sponsoring this roundtable discussion with the World Broadband Alliance um, as part of their Connected Communities Forum. Um, our topic today is the power of broadband infrastructure to enable smart cities. Uh, my name's Clint Vince. I chair Denton's U.S. Energy Practice, and I co-chair our global uh, transportation and infrastructure sector. And together with my teammate, Emma Hand, um, I'm honored to uh, also co-chair this think tank. Um, we have um, a great introduction uh, prepared by Steve Namasivayam, and Steve, why don't I let you uh, begin and welcome. Yeah, thanks very much, Clint, uh, and great pronunciation. Uh, I know it's a challenge on my surname and you nailed it. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to just share my screen. I do want to just um, uh, share a little bit about the WBA and what we're doing in terms of connecting communities. Uh, so hopefully, uh, let me just throw it into Yep, better now. So, and I'll introduce myself. So I'm Steve Namasave. I'm, I'm VP of our Industry Alliances and our membership program at the WBA. Um, I've been with the Alliance for five years, been involved in Wi-Fi uh, for the last 21 years uh, as well. Um, and I just want to outline a bit about what the WBA is doing in this really important area of connecting communities uh, and infrastructure and smart cities as well. Okay. Um, so we, the WBA, are an industry association. Uh, we are effectively are a collaboration platform for over 200 organizations. Um, we do a lot of work to drive Wi-Fi technology forward, to innovate around things like next generation Wi-Fi and service improvements. Um, but one thing that's really important to us, and I think you'll see in this in future slides, is what we can do to help bridge this problem of the digital divide. Um, so we have a very good collection of global members. I'm just showing you some of the, the brands here. Uh, and all of these organizations from the US, from Latin America, from Europe, Asia, uh, they all work together um, on wireless connectivity innovation, uh, but also on you know, how they, what they can do to contribute towards, you know, I think this number of 2.7 billion people that remain unconnected as well. 
Okay. Um, so we initiated the uh, Connected Communities Forum uh, with a couple of advisors on this call today. So we have Al Jenkins uh, and we have Reza. Um, and you'll hear from them today as well. Um, but I think sort of coming out of the uh, sort of COVID-19 uh, pandemic um, a few years back, uh, that just sort of highlighted that connectivity is key. We were all working from home, um, but there are also communities that didn't have connectivity. Uh, and it really sort of, you know, highlighted that actually, yeah, we knew this, but Wi-Fi is a is a is a is a game changer. It's you know, it's a utility uh, effectively as well. And we were doing a lot of work uh, to promote and develop Wi-Fi as a technology, and just felt that there's more that we could do uh, to bring Wi-Fi to bring connectivity into you know people's everyday lives as well. Okay. So we set out these these guiding principles um what can we do around the digital divide what can we do to improve you know, quality of life um to help you know uh, connected communities um collaborate more uh, and shine a light on the issue uh, and with a lot of the work that we're doing in terms of things such as technical standards we run a, a technical standard called open roaming you know what that can do to to help you know people get connected more easily as well okay um our Connected Communities Forum, our, our leadership team, uh, there are four of us. So unfortunately, our, 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 we have our uh, Tiago Rodriguez, our CEO, that he's unfortunately in transit, so he couldn't join us today. Um, but he, he regularly appears uh, on these forums. And I've mentioned Reza Jafari, who's our co-chair and advisor on our CCF, and Al Jenkins, who will be forming part of the, the panel session later as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think that hopefully sort of gives you a bit of an idea overview um, about the WBA and what we're doing uh, in this area. And I think I can hand back to, to Clint and to, to Reza. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Perfect. And again, we're, it's a real pleasure uh, to be able to co-sponsor this with the Wireless Broadband Alliance. And um, you've been a great partner uh, with our think tank for uh, a number of years now. And I'm really... Uh, honored to be able to introduce my special friend, Reza Jafari, who will uh, give us a welcome on behalf of WBA. Reza is the CEO and founder of eDevelopment International, and uh, he's an esteemed advisor uh, to the WBA uh, Connected Communications, uh, Con Connected Communities Forum, as uh, Steve just mentioned. Reza? Yeah, th 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 thank you, Clint, and thank you, Steve, and uh, hello to everyone who's joining us on this inaugural collaborative event of Dentons and WBA. As many of you know, as I uh, have been uh, the pleasure of carrying two hats in the organizing team of this event, as uh, Steve mentioned, uh, serving as the co-chair of the Connected Community Forum for WBA, and second one, uh, I'm also serving as the one of the co-chairs of the Smart Cities and Connected Communities Think Tank of the Dentons. Uh, I would like to express my utmost gratitude uh, for the remarkable leadership of Clint Vince and Tiago Rodriguez, CEO of WBA, for your commitment and dedication to our ecosystem uh, that has been manifested in your daily work for many years and will be partially manifested throughout our webinar today. Looking forward to a very productive, interactive, and informative discussion and the feedback, hopefully, from all of you to improve our work as we move forward. Now, back to you, Mr. Chairman. Clint, back to you. Thank you so much, Raisa. And uh, we so appreciate your involvement in both organizations, and you've enriched our think tank. Um, we are going to launch right into a fireside chat with Rob Schwartz, who is the um, CEO of an amazing company called Anterix. Um, and Terex uh, was founded by Morgan O'Brien, who is the co-founder of Nextel and um, a mentor of Rob's. Uh, and Terex is basically providing private LTE networks uh, to critical infrastructure industry, including utilities. And, um, uh, and Terex also addresses the uh, very important observation by a number of experts now, and I saw it was contained in uh, Steve's introductory comments as well, and that is 
you cannot modernize the electric grid without modernizing communications. So with that, uh, Rob, can you tell us a little bit more about Anterix and then we'll launch into a few interesting uh, things that you're doing. Sure, thank you, Clint. And, and really um, thank you to Denton's and, and the WBA as well for the invitation to participate. And I do have to add Clint, you to that list of, uh, of strong mentors that I have. Um, you know, throughout the organization, throughout the, throughout the, the, um, the organization. Um, a, a couple of thoughts. Um, also, thank you, Steve and, and Reza, also for your opening remarks and looking forward to hearing uh, from Aaron, Allen, David. I know we're going to share insights um, shortly. Um, one comment just on Wi-Fi. I've been a, you know, more than a 30-year veteran um, of the wireless space and, and, and Wi-Fi is really an incredible innovation and, and, and one a phenomenal example showing the value of embracing standards uh, globally, right? The impact of Wi-Fi on all of our lives and communities is nothing short of just fantastic and, and really to a great credit of the WA of bringing together this community. Um, and that ties into kind of your point, Clint, about the, you know, the role of, of, of Anterix. Um, you know, today, as a society, we're at a critical inflection point where diverse sectors like energy, telecom, transportation must also collaborate to advance, you know, economy-wide goals of things like sustainability and resilience, development, equity, and, and, and more than that. Um, you know, key enabling platform for these communities, and I'm going to get to the answer about Anterix because I think it's it's an important kind of background here. Um, but an enabling platform for these smart communities and, and smart energy infrastructure that supports it is, is the electric grid, right? The thing we take for granted that we can plug our Wi-Fi routers into, can plug everything into that, you know, the lights go on when you flip a switch. Um, with the changing dynamics there, um, you know, especially with the commitments to clean energy, resilient electricity, it underpins all of the smart community efforts that, we, that we've talked about and, and this great forum um, has, has had phenomenal discussions on in the past. But with the changes that are occurring, increased electrification, distributed energy resources, smart buildings, smart transportation, and much more all depend on smarter grid infrastructure, energy infrastructure uh, as well. And so as Clint, Clint said, you know, we can't create this necessary modern, resilient, clean electric grid without modern communications. Um, so that kind of gets into the, the enterics of, of our reason for being. Um, we're working in concert with a, a group of utilities um, nationwide in our approach and, and really trying to play a critical role in helping spur smart cities. Um, you know, today, Enteric owns 900 megahertz wireless spectrum nationwide. Wi-Fi depends on its, uh, its specific band. 900 is a low band spectrum used around the globe for, for cellular LTE 4G 5E communications. But the important part of that as a scarce resource is that you know the resilient clean energy future that customers and communities want um, and expect will rely on a clean en energy infrastructure that now with what we're doing is going to be connected via fast secure 900 megahertz private wireless broadband um, you know, electric grid connectivity is based on a foundation of these private wireless networks to empower utilities to fully realize the powerful vision for a cleaner smarter and, and more secure energy landscape. So our, our story is much bigger than just simply enterics, imp importantly, alone. Um, already, the universe of companies driving this collaboration with enterics of this new digital foundation for the energy sector um, is, is already has six pioneering utilities in across 15 states in our nation that have joined us on this journey. Um, there's more than 100 leading technology companies, very similar to the way the WBA has brought together um, such a vast ecosystem of partners. We have over 100 companies that are now developing solutions um, within this important energy community uh, for 900 megahertz. We've established something called the Utility Strategic Advisory Board, where 10 utility senior executives really oversee the, this uh, technology development. And so the, the, the ownership and direction is really coming from within the industry. And lastly, we're working with a collaboratively with a, a lot of key groups, including EPRI, the National Renewable Energy Lab, you know, Pacific Northwest National Lab, many of our national treasures, but to drive this collective solution forward. So 
um, you know, long answer to your qu qu question, Clint, but for us, it's really about this growing universe of leading organizations and individuals that are driving a powerful future for 900 megahertz private wireless broadband and leveraging the industry's deep spirit of connection, interdependency, collaboration uh, to transform the electric grid for all the benefits of communities nationwide. Great overview, Rob. And I, I note, um, and I think Aaron Spears will agree with me that this is the first time possibly in my lifetime that uh, energy lawyers have actually become interesting at cocktail parties. <laughs> and uh, I think part of it is the overlay with the communications uh, industry and the really ubiquitous need of, uh, of electricity to make everything run in our society. Rob, um, Enteryx has a couple of use cases in, in addition to the primary purpose of, of moving huge chunks of data at, at a very fast pace. Um, these use cases, I think, are critical as our industry moves forward. One of them is um, the benefits of having an air gap with respect and private LTE network with respect to cybersecurity, which is an issue that keeps many, many people in critical infrastructure up at night worrying about. Can you describe a little bit your use case for cyber? And then if uh, time permits, we'll also discuss wildfire prevention a little bit. Absolutely, Clint. And let me broaden the question for a minute just to put it in context that, you know, if you think about the the, the phone that's likely in your pocket, right? The, the, the global technology of LTE that we all use, 4G, 5G, and soon well beyond that, it's application driven, right? We first you know, created these phones back in the 90s, early, late, late 80s, to be able to make phone calls and then text messaging. But now it's really about every time you add an application, you're adding something very valuable. You know, you have the Uber app, you're hailing taxi cabs, you have video apps on there and you can, you know, have entertainment. But it's the same technology that's enabling these valuable use cases. You, you mentioned the wildfire mitigation, which is one really important use case. We're working with San Diego Gas and Electric as one example, um, but unfortunately, wildfires is becoming a growing issue across the nation. We've see, seen incidences in Hawaii, in Texas, in California, in Colorado uh, recently, unfortunately. And so the, the, the simple premise um, is, you know, the technology exists, but being able to put what we're working with San Diego and, and, a, and a, a leading company called Schweitzer Engineering out of Washington, um, we put sensors on the lines that, you know, the lines you see that run through our neighborhoods and run through communities to be able to say, if that current stops flowing through a power line, depower that line. So if a tree falls on a line, the line breaks, it takes about 1.4 seconds before it hits the ground. In that time, you wanna be able to depower that line. So when it hits the ground, there's no risk of it sparking and, and either starting a wildfire, being a, a security or safety risk to people in that community. And so um, we've deployed that technology with San Diego with the help of Schweitzer Engineering, and it's successfully working in, in depowering lines. And so the power of just that one application, um, you can imagine, unfortunately, you know, utilities have gone through bankruptcy, lives have been lost in this unfortunate uh, case. And so we're really excited about that as a leading application. In addition to that, uh, we also, as you mentioned, have, have you know, some significant cybersecurity um, elements of it. You know, the, the rule number one of, of, of cybersecurity is, you have to have your, your high value assets on a separate air gapped, as you said, diverse network that's not connected to any, any threat vectors, whether that's foreign entities that we've seen recently in some of the reports put out by the FBI uh, publicly in Congress um, or other nefarious players that unfortunately are continuing to grow. And so uh, we've seen cases where utilities, um, you know, waste management facilities already have, they found um, you know, that nefarious players have put uh, viruses in place to be able to shut down these critical assets in our, in our nation. And so we're helping separate these critical assets to give a level of command and control um, and, and, and awareness, which is really important. You know, a lot of these things historically, uh, you know, power lines is a good example, transformers weren't connected to any communications network. Um, and so the ability just to have this visibility and control is the beginning, but doing so on a private secure network 
is another important part. One other you know, critical use case for us um, is, is about uh, connecting up all of the new distributed energy sources, solar, wind, battery storage, electric vehicles, you know, electrification of industries. You can't have this new distributed sources of energy without a two-way communication capability that's highly resilient, highly secure. And so we're very focused also on, on that as another application to be able to meet all of the critical decarbonization goals we've set individually for utilities and collectively as a nation. Rob, it's, uh, it's been exciting to uh, watch Anterix really become known and take off. And it's also incredibly valuable that there are some solutions to two really huge problems for the uh, critical infrastructure, but particularly utilities in terms of the cyber and, um, and wildfire. But by the way, I don't know if you can hear it, but my building has decided to provide some background entertainment for this discussion. So it's not a rock band, but we have some great hammering and a little bit of drilling just to enhance uh, the moment. So I hope it's, it's not uh, disruptive and I will uh, mute when our other guests are talking. Is there anything, Rob, that you would like to uh, um, convey to our audience to close out this great fireside chat? I think, you know, again, just coming back to the common theme of, of what, um, you know, our, the, the WBA does and what we do um, is, is the collective action, right? We, we work with our utility partners, Denton's as an important partner, um, with our ecosystem partners, um, with the government entities we're working with, and that collective action in, in building a cleaner, smarter, stronger energy future, um, you know, to meet our net zero commitments, making the electric grid more resilient, um, it's a business imperative for us, and we're honored to be able to share that um, with this di distinguished group. So thank you, Clint, for that, and, and look forward to uh, talking and hearing the, the comments of the rest of the, of the panel. I'm so glad you were able to join us today, Rob. I know that you had a really complex schedule and, and deeply appreciate your uh, fitting us in. And great job today, as always. Thank you, Clint. Thank you, everybody. We're going to uh, now launch straight into our panel. Uh, we have four pretty amazing panelists uh, from around the U.S., and also we've reached over to the U.K. to uh, get a point of view um, that's more global for us. And we're going to begin with Al Jenkins, who, as Steve mentioned, is a uh, board advisor for the Wireless Broadband Alliance and a co-leader in the um, Connected Communities Forum. Steve, can you... Tell us a little bit more about yourself and also uh, the importance of the uh, Connected Communities Forum from your vantage point. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Steve could. I, I'll do the same. Um, so I'm Al Jenkins. Pleasure to, to meet you all. I, I'm an advisor at the uh, Connected Communities uh, Advisory Board at the WBA. I also independently work as a sort of broadband mapping uh, designer for a variety of different mobile network operators and cable operators around the country, as well as prepare business case analysis for them. I work with a lot of municipalities, both domestic as well as international, along with uh, the WBA and as well as independently, and sort of driving a um, sort of a uniform collection for uh, municipalities to think about how to deploy broadband services with the variety of different mobile network operators, fiber and cable operators that are in their respective geographies, as well as how to manage the use and centralize the use of their telecommunications assets, both horizontal as well as vertical. And so that's in a nutshell sort of what I do collectively for both, both the WBA as well as independently. And Al, I know that you have been uh, encouraging your membership uh, to work more carefully with uh, public-private partnerships. H how is that uh, going and what are you seeing? So one of the things I encourage through the WBA, uh, particularly over the last six or seven years, is how municipalities are engaging with the local telecommunications providers in their geography. 
Um, one of the ways I do that is by sort of brokering a, a discussion on the centralization of, of management for telecommunications assets. Many of the urban areas as well as suburban and rural already have telecommunications assets in the ground, but haven't been managed as such. Some could be electric utility poles to water tanks to streetlight poles to a variety of other traditional and non-traditional telecommunications assets. So what I do is put everyone in the room and look at what those assets are, particularly with municipal agencies. Uh, sort of coming together, trying to find one person to broker for the use of those assets, not just through third party providers, but for the municipality itself to be able to grow its own smart city telecommunications base. One of those things that we do, uh, Clint, is, is brokering for sort of one dig policies so that when uh, rights of way are open, for example, and conduits are laid, uh, that the municipality can actually broker for the use of some of their own future conduits, opposed to opening the same right of way 10 or 15 times for 10 or different uh, franchisees that are in the city. I, I think it, 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 one of the things that we do at WBA also is encourage municipalities to understand where the digital divide is. Um, in a lot of cases now, specifically now that there are a lot of federal grants that are on the ground, statewide grants and local grants that are proliferating telecommunications, one of the conditions is to determine where your unserved and underserved are. You know that the FCC has just increased the bar for broadband speeds to 100 by 20, which means that particularly urban areas now have a larger gap in reference to unserved and underserved residents, as well as community anchor institutes that they have to really make assessments of accurately in order for them to gain funding from both federal and state sources. And so those are some of the things that I do. Uh, I'll give you another example in terms of the private and, and, and public partnerships where municipalities engage with those third parties to support uh, municipal agencies to build telecommunication services, whether it's the police department, whether it's fire, whether it's transportation, whether it's environmental. Uh, but so 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 I bring together vendors, particularly uh, those that are seasoned in the WBA to municipalities who uh, could utilize their services, not only to provide telecommunication services for them uh, directly to the agencies, but also for them to partner in terms of having an established telecommunications organization uh, file for a variety of different grants to show those grant funders that they are actually participating with those that are seasoned and doing uh, telecommunications deployment and implementation. There's such a uh, hefty chunk of wisdom in what you've just said in such a succinct way. We. I do a lot of work with municipals and I, I really see the need to have coordination at the highest level of uh, municipal governance. And we're fortunate today to have uh, several leaders in uh, different um, municipalities in the US and in uh, UK, who I know will elaborate further on your observations and also um, on your uh, pointing out some of the difficulty in access uh, to the internet uh, within not just uh, rural locations, but actually some of our metropolises as well. There is, uh, before we go th on through the panel, and I will come back to you uh, with several other questions, but uh, you also have experience in something very near and dear to my heart because I also represent some rural electric cooperatives. And I know that you have uh, um, some advice on how to develop broadband, further develop broadband among uh, in rural communities using uh, electric cooperatives as a model. Well, yeah, I've been working with a lot of uh, co-ops uh, in the United States particularly around um, really understanding their own infrastructure plant. Um, and I'm saying that in a good way, uh, in a way that now can be used for specifically deploying broadband in rural areas where um, state government agencies have given them access to provide that broadband services. And, 
and many years before, they were not regulated to do so. In this case, uh, a lot of the electrical co-ops are actually coming together, taking a look at their assets. All of them uh, traditionally have been uh, electrical uh, supply assets, but along with tower, radio towers, along with poles, uh, wood utility poles, as well as other type of 115 kV and 250 kV utility assets. Now those assets can actually be used to proliferate both wireless and wireline deployments like never before. And so, so now that the uh, electrical co-ops now have uh, already an existing uh, um, uh, telecommunications infrastructure base, it's best to, with now to sort of broker with multiple carriers to provide those telecommunications services to rural areas where those carriers really had um, issues, CapEx issues particularly, to serve those rural areas because there were no infrastructure there. But with partnering with the electrical companies to do so, now there is a great partnership, both municipal, both both private and public, uh, that can reach those rural communities a lot faster, a lot quicker, and a lot less expensive than have to do that independently. So I think the electrical co-ops are in a great place uh, with existing infrastructure to broker the proliferation of broadband services, particularly to rural areas, uh, better than ever before. Love hearing that message, and I agree with it 100%. And uh, would be happy to help you with any introductions in that uh, sector of, uh, of energy supply in the US, but it doesn't sound like you need any introductions. I think you're, you're right uh, spot on. And um, let me move forward, Al, and we'll, we will come back uh, to talk to you further, but I'd like to introduce David Wilkins, who is the head of uh, the Smart Cities program at Westminster City Council um, in the UK. David, can you explain your role with a little more care and give us an overview of what you have been doing with uh, Westminster that is pretty exciting, I think? Yeah, I'm happy to. So firstly, thank you for, for having me on this panel. It's great to hear the challenges for the, the common challenges that we share with, with yourselves overseas. Um, so um, I head up the Smart City team at Westminster City Council. Um, my role covers a number of different areas. One is around um, addressing and improving um, digital infrastructure within Westminster. So we do quite a lot of mapping of our um, infrastructure. So um, within uh, Westminster, it, it's um, part of central London. Um, we have real challenges with mobile phone capacity. So have you ever been in a really busy city where you can get reception, but have insufficient capacity to make a call, access Google Maps? Um, we've been doing quite a lot of work with our waste team. I believe you call it your sanitation department over in America, where we've attached um, uh, kind of things within our waste trucks that at regular intervals measure download, upload and signal strength for the mobile carriers. And then we look at the locations where there's poor connectivity and use city assets to um, address that. So by city assets, it's already been mentioned today, um, we use our lamp columns um, to attach small cells that address both 4G and 5G uh, capacity constraints that the city faces. We also take a similar approach to um, fiber infrastructure. So um, we have a really um, clear understanding about where within the city is currently served and where isn't served. And we seek to create the right conditions for the market to invest in the locations where there is poor um, connectivity. So that can include demand stimulation in the form of vouchers um, to um, breaking down and busting barriers. Um, so barriers that we face, um, there are the legal barriers in associated with signing way leaves. So um, that's the kind of um, legal agreement you need to connect um, um, uh, uh, lay infrastructure over land. Um, so we've been doing work to standardize that to address that particular barrier. The second area of focus that I have is all of this infrastructure is fantastic, but it's not good unless people can use it. So I have a big focus on um, digital inclusion. So um, within Westminster, we've halved 
digital exclusion year on year for the last few years, taking it from um, 8% to 4% to 2%. Um, but we have pockets of Westminster where that figure is around um, 16 to 18%. Um, so we're really keen on supporting our residents to um, have the skills and confidence um, to use digital to enrich their lives, but also have access to affordable broadband, um, but also the, the devices um, so that we can kind of really support residents to um, enrich and enhance their lives through digital. And the final area of, of my work focuses on um, how the municipality, how, how the city council can use this infrastructure um, to um, deliver better services. So we have um, kind of programs of rolling out sensors. Um, a good example of that, um, I think you highlighted that you've got some construction noise going on in the background, Clint. Um, so within Westminster, our major construction sites, we've mandated them to install noise, vibration and um, dust sensors um, so we can get early indication of issues um, so that we can uh, be more proactive at um, enforcing those sites so that it, it causes less frustration to our citizens. And we have a, a kind of goal within Westminster is um, we're failing if our citizens need to report issues to us. So we've got a whole program focusing on how we can identify those issues before they become a reportable event. Um, so some other examples of that could be image AI to detect the deterioration of our road surfaces and potholes. It could be the detection of graffiti and um, fly tipping. Fly tipping, I don't think is an American term, but is in effect people um, leaving waste um, in, in, in the city. So um, we're, we're, we're taking a big focus on identifying the issues that citizens have and seeing if we can detect them early um, using um, technology um, so that we can improve um, kind of uh, our citizen experience. So that's a quick overview about kind of what my role covers. Happy to go into more detail in, in any areas of interest. Thank you, Dave. And, and I'm going to come back to you in a minute and ask you a little bit about some of the challenges that you have faced and um, potential solutions for those challenges. And if you can ship that technology, that sensor technology over to me, I would uh, greatly appreciate it. I'll share it with our building uh, leadership. And um, I do want to encourage uh, our audience to feel free to put questions into our Q&A uh, feature. I see one question, Rob Schwartz, I'm not sure if you're still with us, but um, when we uh, go through the panel initially, uh, if you can take a look at that question, uh, it might be if you, you might have the best background to answer it. And if not, we will, uh, we, we will move on. But um, our next um, panelist, Aaron Spears, is the dynamic head of the uh, New Orleans City Council's Utility Regulatory Office and a special friend for many years and, um, and has done some really great work in New Orleans. And Aaron, can you um, uh, come off mute and tell us, uh, first of all, if you could explain the uniqueness of the New Orleans City Council in terms of its regulatory authority and then talk to us a little bit about your, uh, what your experiences are with uh, broadband. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Aaron Spears. As Clint said, I lead up the Utility Regulatory Office here for the New Orleans City Council. Uh, also similar to Clint, you may hear some sounds of the city. I'm in downtown New Orleans right now, uh, where my office is located, and there are always some sound effects in the background. Uh, as oh, also the necessary precursor. My opinions are my own and not that of the New Orleans City Council. So if I say anything that is controversial, just blame me, not my bosses, please. Uh, so as Clint said, the city of New Orleans is unique in a lot of different ways, particularly in the regulatory space. The New Orleans City Council is the public service commission for the city of New Orleans. So unlike other jurisdictions that have a standalone PSC or have a PSC at the state level, New Orleans City Council regulates utility service providers in the within the jurisdiction of Orleans Parish. 
or county as the case may be, depending on where you are. Um, in addition to that, New Orleans City Council is in charge of franchising. So we are the authority that grants permission to dig in the public right of way and install wireless infrastructure. So we've had, we get to wear a lot of different hat, hats. We do a land use, we do a little regulatory work, and it has put us in a very good position to, as Al pointed out, understand where the needs are in the city and where we can improve, particularly in areas of knowing where infrastructure is. New Orleans is 300 years old, which is old by American standards, though it feels weird with Westminster online to say that 300 years old is old, but we're, we're old here. And so we don't know where everything is. And as we encountered more and more of an understanding of where the digital divide was, particularly during the pandemic, we also began to understand what we didn't know about where infrastructure lies. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation and ways that we as municipality can improve on the coordination that Al talked about, but also where we at the various levels of this industry can better coordinate to ensure that everyone is getting access to this broadband service that a few people have touched on is so necessary to function in this daily life that we have encountered. Aaron, to bring this home for our audience and, and the scale of it, what percentage of the population in New Orleans does not have consistent um, access to the internet? Right. So 29% of homes in New Orleans do not have consistent access to internet, which means they don't have a home-based internet service provider. They don't have broadband. Um, of that, of the remaining 29%, about half of that relies on cellular data to use internet at home. 10% have no access to internet at all. And 3% depend on a service without a subscription, which is trying to pick up a wireless signal from uh, a public network or a network without a security password, which as we all know is not ideal. Uh, imagine trying to pay your bills or file your taxes on a public Wi-Fi system. It's, you know, it, it gives me a little hive to think about. So yeah. the situation is dire. What are some of the uh, challenges you're seeing in New Orleans and at other um, municipal governments are facing in in trying to really close the digital divide? So one real issue is that the FCC and its efforts to encourage broadband deployment has really limited what municipalities can do in this area in terms of setting fees, getting access to what infrastructure is being put in, in the right of way. For example, we have areas of New Orleans that fall into that 71% of having access to internet, but it's a copper-based line from the 90s. You know, you have homes in 2024 that are essentially still on dial-up. It's not great. Also, we have no way of enforcing companies to have equitable access throughout or to create programming structures that allow children or low income or older populations to ensure that they have access in the same way that we ensure that homes have electric and gas and water. Internet is quickly falling into that same utility category, but we don't treat it that way. And we should, you can't have telehealth if you don't have a reliable internet connection. You can't do your homework if you don't have a reliable internet connection. You can't apply for jobs if you don't have a reliable internet connection. You can't access this wonderful think tank <laughs> if you don't have a reliable internet connection. So more and more we're seeing that there's a community need, but lo local governments don't have the enforcement powers or the regulatory powers that it needs to really ensure that the divide is is shrunk. So that's that's really the biggest challenge that we're facing. Thank you, Aaron. Great job. We're going to um, turn.
turn now to Michael Sherwood, who is the Chief Innovation and Technology Officer for the City of uh, Las Vegas. And Michael, if you could uh, tell us some more about your role and what you're seeing in Las Vegas. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it's great to be here uh, and hard act to follow Aaron and David both. I mean, they're doing some really great things and and I think Vegas, just like New Orleans and Westminster, are all struggling with the same challenges. Um, how do we increase connectivity? Uh, I think all of us on this panel and, and on this call realize that connectivity holds keys to the future, whether it be education, you can call it workforce development, you can call it living life, um, you need connectivity. And like many places around the world, Las Vegas, a little bit different. We like to pride ourselves on being a little different. We have mass influx of individuals that come um, for a day or two days. And so our ability to service them and to continue to operate as a um, organization and community are sometimes strained when you have large events and ensuring that we are um, focused on not just events here in Las Vegas, but really Las Vegas, like many cities, but really us, we are focused in a hospitality world, a hospitality environment, which is number one for automation um, during the pandemic. I think we've all seen automated bartending now is here in Las Vegas. We have automated house cleaning systems uh, all of those are displacing human capital. And without connectivity, how do you raise and create new job opportunities for those being displaced? And so, again, much like New Orleans, very much we have franchise agreements. We work with the community and, and, and new providers coming into the market. I think really the challenge for us is how do we make it attractive for the incumbents that are here to continue to invest while we also bring choice and opportunity into the community by bringing new providers uh, as well uh, to help supplement. Um, there are traditionally places that are underserved that incumbents have not provided service. We need to find ways to get the incumbents as well as new entrants to work through that. Um, and then much like Westminster, Las Vegas, you know, we pride ourselves on innovation. I mean, we build volcanoes in the middle of the desert. We have all types of opulent things throughout um, but there's a lot of things that connectivity and is, is critical for. Water management and maintenance um, for us, extremely critical here in the desert. Um, also, our resources are stretched thin. So we use more and more connectivity to monitor for graffiti. Um, I love what David said about Westminster and the fact that we're trying to do the same um, using technology, using connectivity to help supplement and become more efficient as a community. We want to know things that are happening before the citizen reports it. Again, keeping a great amenity base. I don't want to say it's a run for um, taxpayers, but we have a state to the left of us who a lot of people are moving um, and they're moving eastwards. And so we want to be, if we don't have the proper connectivity, we're not going to capture those individuals. They're going to go farther east to where those amenities are. So it's not just about the best schools and about the best safety anymore. A lot of people look to buy a home, they check for schools, safety, and then connectivity. So we as a community have to have all of those things in line. And, and it's challenging. Um, you have a challenge of, of getting the community to understand road work um, you know, and, and the ability to get these systems deployed. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of new technology. We've just recently here in Southern Nevada approved micro-trenching. Uh, this is our second go at micro-trenching. So we're hoping to see some better results this time to help expedite uh, connectivity. But overall, I, I think, you know, across Nevada, um, we're doing a much better job in the last few years since the pandemic in trying to bring connectivity to the community to really listen to our community um, and some of those things we've done um, in closing here that are kind of unique that we hope spread and that we can work with other municipalities are, we've created a 3D print center um, that allows people to, from their home, um, access 3D printers. We're uh, trying to become an advanced manufacturing state. And so again, we're providing a lot of services via connectivity, um, access to cyber ranges. So if you wanna grow your skills in cybersecurity, we'll get you the connectivity. 
If you don't have it in your home, though, you can come in a short distance to downtown and access all the same resources. So you can access how to do 3D printing and advanced manufacturing technologies. You can get trained on cybersecurity. We do culinary. So lots of different opportunities to help shift our, our economy from those uh, service jobs that we know will be impacted over the next five years. And I haven't even mentioned AI, I, I don't wanna go there, but again, that's just another wave of, of disruption that we need to be prepared for. And it all comes down to connectivity and it comes down to great events like this. I, I you, know, you pick up on so much from both Aaron and David and all the other panelists um, that have provided some great information that helps me do my job better, which really makes me excited to be here. So thank you. Thank you, Michael, wonderful overview. I actually, my next question was to ask you if you're seeing the impact of accelerated uh, application of AI on the uh, subjects you've talked about. Is that a, are you comfortable with that topic? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty much comfortable with anything. Um, you know, as long as it's, I, I will say what I didn't go because I'm going to go follow under Aaron's rule. These are my own opinions and thoughts. They're not the thoughts expressed by this Las Vegas community or the city council. But look, here's the here's the uh, the real deal is that AI is going to have impacts. We can debate what those impacts might be. But my job is to prepare the community and to work with other departments within the city that goes for our youth and social innovation, our housing, um, our, our homelessness and community outreach groups. Look, AI is going to impact jobs. It's going to create opportunities. I think cities really will start focusing. Now, you'll see as a broad uh, area um, where you're going to start seeing cities get more involved in educational opportunities, more involved in workforce development and training. Uh, there is a huge need here locally in Las Vegas, and, and I can say in most cities, for cybersecurity specialists, for um, fiber installers, for maintenance, for anything technology related, there is generally a demand for that. AI is going to disrupt some, again, the service industry. It, it's definitely going to do a lot. Um, and so we've got to be ready. We've got to be ready for that. But look, Las Vegas, I will say New Orleans, I'm going to throw them in with us. They've been through challenges. They've had hurricanes. They have recovered. Um, Las Vegas was completely shut down like most of the United States. We've gone through tra tragedies as well. But one thing about American cities, and I'd say cities around the world, so I'll, again, is my opinions, not the city Las Vegas opinions. But look, resiliency, challenge creates better communities and, and people rally around and move forward. So while AI, I think, is scary to a lot of people, we need to embrace it. We need to embrace connectivity. We need to embrace education. And, and by doing that and not be afraid to, to implement technology, but fully embrace it, learn from it, understand the pitfalls, have good policies and governance, and then go forward. Thank you so much, Michael, and uh, the great uh, advancement of our discussion. I have um, our think tank has really uh, focused very heavily on AI, and we've had two um, two roundtables already in the last um, four months on this subject. It's something that is coming with such speed and scale that um, I I think it will be it will bring many many benefits, but also tremendous disruption, as you've pointed out. Um, let me uh, switch to. Rob Schwartz for a moment, and then I'll come back to Al Jenkins. Rob, have you had a chance to see this question? I I have, Clint, and but I see that Al already uh, preempted and put a great answer out there. It sounds like an area of, of his expertise as well. So uh, in regard to the FCC's redefinition of broadband, and my only comment to, to add to Al's expertise is that, you know, having lived through the, the generations of 1G technology now through 5G and will go well beyond is that, you know, like, you know, vehicles or airplanes, you know, will continue to move at faster and faster speeds driven by the needs of, that are driven by, by use cases and applications. So it's not surprising that the FCC continues to look at larger numbers. Hopefully that all of the, the systems in place will continue to serve communities and, and we'll be able to use that higher standard to drive greater penetration of even higher speeds to, to those in need. And Rob, you've seen uh, Mike Oldak's question? 
Um, yes, I do see yeah. it there. Um, so just maybe I'll repeat it back to those who don't see it, but Mike is asking about, please discuss how private utility owned LT is important from a latency and reliability uh, stand, standpoint. Um, so yeah, so private LT, the technology that Enterix is helping use the same technology that your 4G, 5G phones use. Um, one of the key valuable pieces in getting to the you know, latency really means the speed at which packets, data packets can move and so when you're using uh, it for doing things like I mentioned, you know, wildfire mitigation, um, you have fractions of a second, milliseconds as we call them, um, to be able to decision upon the data you're getting and react before there's there's a disaster. And so LTE is inherently built with the lowest latency and, and the 4G into 5G technology, that's really what keeps improving. And so that that speed is is really critical and, and, and we're delivering it um, you know, by bringing those kind of standardized high-speed technologies, low latency, um, to the to the marketplace. I'm glad Mike asked that question. I just wish that um, PG&E and now uh, in Texas, uh, the utilities there had been able to take advantage of your falling line conductor uh, application because it's. Uh, it, I think it would have prevented tremendous. Uh, Loss of life and and tremendous loss of uh, of property uh, in a beneficial way. So I hope, you know, my wish is that this technology becomes better known and and develops very rapidly because I think it can help a lot of critical infrastructure uh, industries in wildfire prone areas. Thank you, uh, Rob, for coming back and fielding those two questions. Sure, and right. um, Al, let me um, ask you first, if you have um, any written materials that capture the thoughts that you raised a few moments ago, I would love to be able to have uh, Dorinda Graves share that with the audience if they're available. Certainly, um, you know, I've done some work uh, in New York City uh, where I served as a former deputy commissioner for telecommunications planning uh, there. It, uh, I had created um, a lot of white papers at the Telecom Infra Project on um, specifically around uh, the infrastructure use in municipalities as well as suburban areas in conjunction with how to identify those un and unserved. And it even goes as far as uh, into... Uh, the tribal nations, um, uh, as you know now, they're trying to build broadband and, and high-speed broadband into tribal areas in the United States. And so I've got some, I've got some areas of study and white paper in, in those three areas that I can certainly share with you. That'd be really uh, terrific. We do a lot of work in uh, Indian country, and um, this issue is increasingly important everywhere. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Uh, constituency as well. Um, Al, I know that you've had experience with uh, broadband map mapping and um, uh, business case analysis. Are you able to discuss that with us uh, today? Sure. I, can, uh, I can give you a quick overview as to what we do for a variety of different clients, both of them, their mobile network operators and particularly cable and fiber operators. Now that there is a large amount of grant money uh, from the federal government through NTIA and their B program, middle mile program, many of the incumbent operators as well as new uh, operators are looking to provide uh, new fiber as well as fixed wireless services in areas where they are underserved. And so what the broadband mapping and data process does is takes a look at every single state in the continental U.S., determine whether there are already grants that have been issued, broad grant, broadband grants specifically, from the federal government or through the Treasury Department, through the capital projects funding, and or whether or not there are some existing residual ARPA funds that are left in a variety of cities and states, on top of that, there are a lot of states that, that, that issue their own uh, grants that are unique to their own states, like North Carolina, uh, Louisiana, to include Illinois. And so 
what the challenge actually is, Clint, for a lot of incumbent operators as, as well as a lot of new uh, potential operators is first to determine where these grants have been issued in order to understand where the eligible areas to provide service are so that you can uh, apply for new grant services. That is a complication in itself to understand that most state GIS departments don't have that capability. It was never their core capability. And so having that capability, being able to overlap a variety of different grants federal, state, local, then determine where the eligible areas are. And then from that point, then determine where those unfunded, unserved or underserved residents and community anchor institutions are, only then makes you eligible to apply for the grants that are there. And so that is, and then and from that point, then determine what your business case analysis may be. Should, should I be deploying fiber? Uh, to extend my existing fiber plant, or should I actually, because there is a lack of volume or residents or community anchor institutions in one certain area, should I now um, look at building a new radio tower to serve it with fixed wireless services? Uh, and so that combination of extending an existing fiber plant to building new fixed wireless resources uh, concludes into a business case analysis to put into your grant application, which state broadband officials are specifically looking for to assess whether you're eligible for those grant funds. And so that's a quick summary of sort of how that works for a variety of different clients around the U.S. that are feverishly applying for grants right now to include, by the way, many municipalities who are eligible to apply for these very same grants to extend their own municipal uh, fiber networks or wireless networks. Uh, they too are eligible from the federal and state grants that, 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 that are available for broadband services now. Thank you, Al. And what is your level of optimism as we're moving forward? If we follow your advice, are we going to make uh, big improvements at scale? I think so. I think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, getting fiber to every single household in the United States might be a little ambitious, <laughs> but uh, I do believe with the combination of both fiber and wireless, uh, I think the majority of the United States can be served, as well as I do think that may maybe, maybe, you know, the, the issuance of those grant monies and the timeline that is made available to deploy those fiber and wireless services are reasonable. Um, so I do think I'm optimistic that one, the federal government is issuing those grant monies as they've done to the tune of millions already for tribal broadband uh, grants as well as community anchor institution grants. And they're starting to issue grants very quickly for middle mile as well. So. My optimism for the federal government releasing those funds that they promised are good. Um, my, 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 my optimism in reference to municipalities as well as third parties coming together in private public partnerships to actually deliver um, the, the, the fiber and fixed wireless that they've uh, applied for is optimistic. Some of those have already finished. Uh, some of deployment of fiber as well as uh, fixed wireless in some of the areas they've been giving grant to already. So I, I wouldn't suspect that that would uh, fall off or discontinue. Um, I, I think the, the only issue I'd be aware of, of those that may have applied for those grants that now are in default of, of bringing up new funds to deploy those. And now you have to kind of remove those grants off the table and make those new uh, available. Again, that becomes a complication in the process, but nevertheless, uh, I do think the federal government is on top of those um, default uh, applicants and have made them av uh, newly available for those to reapply for those. So I'm optimistic about that as well. So, yep. Thank you, Al, really helpful. We're, we're going to continue through the panel, but I will, uh, if time permits, I will come back for one last very quick question in a lightning round and just ask each of you to, um, if there's uh, just a minute or two of guidance that you want to leave the audience with. But um, let's um, move to David Wilkins. And uh, David, can you describe with us a little bit 
uh, some of the challenges that you've been facing, maybe elaborate on them um, in terms of um, uh, moving forward on this subject and things you've had to overcome in order to reach the, the great achievements you've already uh, succeeded on in Westminster. Yeah, happy to. So if I just outline very briefly the achievements that we have 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 achieved and then, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about some of the challenges along the way. So um, Westminster is in central London. Um, back when I started, um, if you were looked at kind of national broadband tables, um, Westminster was actually 638th out of the 650 um, local authorities for um, broadband availability. So if you were to look at us on a ranking, places like rural Scotland and Wales had better connectivity than central London. I won't go into the details about why that is, but I think that gives you a sense of, of where our starting point was. Um, we now have some of the highest full fibre availability levels in the country. Um, and um, uh, I'm just going to tell you some of the things, the barriers that we had. So um, within Westminster, there was very little activity from the um, monopoly operator in upgrading their copper networks. Um, so one of our big focuses was about creating the right conditions for the market to invest. So one of the projects that we launched was a, a voucher scheme to support our businesses to get connected to fibre. Um, so um, the, the business challenge um, was instead of using um, uh, kind of the, the broadband infrastructure, we had um, post-production companies, um, Oscar winning post-production companies cycling around memory sticks and hard drives on bicycles instead of using the broadband infrastructure. Um, so we had a real problem um, with connectivity. So um, over the course of a few years, we provided funding to support those businesses to get connected to fibre. We connected around 850 and um, we followed their businesses and find, found out kind of what that actually meant for them. So going from unconnected to connected. And um, one year post connection, the average turnover growth for firms who participated that attributed um, the turnover increases to their improved broadband was a 2.2% increase in turnover. And that amounts to close to a billion pounds of additional turnover in those firms. And they also kind of um, suggested that they'd had um, productivity and um, kind of cost savings as a result of that infrastructure. And that was around um, kind of 8%. And again, that's 810 million pounds of savings and productivity growth. So um, when you take that in the round, for every pound we invested as a as a council uh, or as a as a public authority, there was 200 pounds worth of public benefit as a result. Um, that's very kind of economic analysis of, of kind of what we achieved. But if you look um, beyond the the kind of quantitative side and look at kind of what that means from a social perspective. Um, it increased labour force participation. So firms were saying that it enabled kind of um, women to return to the workforce quicker following um, having children. Um, we saw that it enabled people with disabilities or who had caring responsibilities to return to the workforce. So we, what we saw is a lot of societal benefits around that greater um, kind of labour force participation. Um, some other challenges we faced within Westminster, I touched upon very briefly um, the legal agreement to, to connect um, properties. Um, so we standardised that and as a city, we made our 21,000 units of property um, available to broadband providers to connect. And as a result of that, we we're at around 97% full fibre in our um, social housing. Um, and in those places, they provide affordable um, broadband connectivity, but also provide free connectivity in some of the community halls. So there's many locations with a really good base level of connectivity. Um, and another challenge um, that we face is it's incredibly expensive to dig in, um, in an urban environment like Westminster. Um, so we have a number of programs that help to reduce those build costs. So a few examples of those initiatives are, um, so within Westminster, if you want to suspend a parking bay, you typically have to pay a fee for that. Um, so we significantly reduced um, those fees so that um, we brought down the build costs by about a third. 
and that stimulated the market to deploy significantly more fiber um, within the city. Um, and we also kind of encourage um, asset reuse. So within the city, many um, public entities have ducting under the ground. Um, so that ducting has recently been made available um, by TfL to um, for broadband providers to use that existing ducting to connect premises, use our um, tube network to um, take fibre long distances to, to take it to pockets of the city that was um, typically underserved. So there are a few examples on a fibre side about how we've helped to create the right conditions for the market to invest. Um, yeah, uh, don't want to monopolise the conversation. I don't know if you want to to ask, a, ask another question or to another panel member? That was really an uplifting report, David. If if there's anything else you would like to supplement, please do that now and then um, we'll give you that chance um, in a lightning round to, to give um, an essential kernel of guidance to the audience. Yeah, so just one other thing I'll, I'll touch upon um, the wireless side um, and I'll, I'll frame it as a challenge, but also an opportunity. Um, so within Westminster, we did quite a lot of persona mapping of um, digitally excluded residents. So we interviewed people to understand the root cause of digital exclusion. And some of the findings, um, I think everyone would agree, are quite horrific. We had children congregating around schools um, where they could access free public Wi-Fi because they didn't have it within their home. We had families, and I think this was a shared experience in, in New Orleans, families running their whole home broadband using cellular. Um, but that presents really unique challenges for households. What we found was that they would have an internet connection, but it would only be for the first few days or the first week of the month. But there'd be a, a long period in the month where they would have no connectivity. So that impacts education attainment, the ability for... Um, kind of um, staying connected with the community, accessing jobs. But there is an opportunity and, and we really thank you for the WBA in the creation of the open roaming standard. Um, so within Westminster, we have huge amounts of free public Wi-Fi that is of an incredibly high standard. Um, we have um, something called business improvement districts that deploy public Wi-Fi, the council has it in our street markets and in community halls and other venues. Um, but again, the user experience of those networks is relatively poor. Um, the way you access those networks are through kind of captive portals, you put details in, data is harvested from the individuals, whereas open roaming is kind of connected through the provision of a certificate. So what we're trying to do as a city is how can we start to knit together those disparate Wi-Fi networks and create a seamless user experience so that we can start to um, offset the amount of time that residents need our, our kind of data pool so that they have data throughout the whole month because there are these pockets and locations across the city that they can access free public Wi-Fi. And yeah, we've really valued WBA in their kind of development of that standard and promotion of that. And we're really keen to see it kind of spread across Westminster and um, the rest of London. Thank you so much, David. And I, I'm glad you added that additional point. And uh, you're correct, Aaron has uh, definitely witnessed uh, some of the issues that you've been describing. And Aaron, why don't we let you uh, go next and talk to us a little bit about some of the um, obstacles you've been facing and, and a few of your recommendations. Right. Uh, and I'm actually going to pick up where, where David left off during the pandemic, particularly in 2020 when schools were closed and children were learning remotely. We had children huddling in fast food parking lots trying to pick up on the Wi-Fi signal from, from these institutions. Um, I was pulling up some numbers and roughly 23% of the New Orleans population lives in poverty. And as cost of living increases, when you're trying to figure out how to make ends meet, internet feels in the moment like something you can live without. And it's interesting to me how 
the number of households without internet largely tracks the number of households living in poverty and largely tracks with the number of homes in historically marginalized communities that can't seem to move up. It, internet access is a utility in the sense of you need it to improve your outcome in life. You need it to improve your socioeconomic status, improve your, your health. If you live in a community where you can't get to a hospital because it takes you 20 to 30 minutes, telehealth can save your life. It's, it's important, as Michael mentioned, when we're trying to attract people to our city, they're looking to see where they can live that has reliable access to internet, where they can start their business. And as Al and Michael and David have all pointed out, our utilities are also reliant upon internet to keep those systems running. So I, I don't know that I can stress enough how important the work that we are doing in this area, but also how far we still have to go to make a difference in these areas that are often left behind. And with the rapid acceleration of how much we need these services and the industries that are reliant upon them, I am so concerned about leaving behind the people that are often left behind as society advances. So that's that's my pitch. You know, internet is a utility and should be treated as such. Aaron, we're going to invite you to uh, work with the editorial board of our think tank to write a thought piece on that because I think it's really important and um, and something that is not being done now um, at all. So we we will come back to you on that uh, really essential point. I think we have just enough time for Michael, and then we'll do our lightning round and then have um, Steve close us out. So Michael, what are um, some of your observations based on the discussion you've just heard, some of the obstacles you've been overcoming, and uh, any other key points that you'd like to raise? Sure. It's really hard going after two great individuals already gave some great feedback and, and challenged uh, very similar for us here. I think some of the things we did differently, maybe I'll take a little different tact here, um, is we launched our own private cellular network um, during the pandemic um, where we provide connectivity um, to the community uh, about anywhere from at the height that was about 5,000. We're down to maybe 2,500 today. But that private cellular network running under CBRS um, provides connectivity to those individuals that don't have connectivity. Or what a lot of us haven't discussed is that the limited bandwidth in the home. So a home of four or five people, imagine trying to have somebody stream, having watch TV through streaming, and then a child trying to do their homework and download videos. You can't. And there's only so much connectivity in homes. And so our mission and goal by launching a private network was to make it an educational first network, uh, an education and capability that would allow children, regardless of their household's overall connectivity, access to their school, access to the resources from the school. So we don't provide true internet connectivity. We provide what the school provides. So we just provide connectivity to the school. And then we allow the school to kind of provide what the student needs in order to be successful. So it's a great example of, of a partnership between the city and the school district, which is completely separate from the city. Uh, it also provides a great example of how technology can be leveraged for helping uh, fill gaps where um, you know certain providers just haven't made it pencil out financially, um, where a government agency can help uh, create opportunity. We've also found it to be having our own private network uh, very useful in, in other verticals within the city. Air quality sensors can be put up now and connected, less cost to operate. So there's a lot of other interesting verticals there, but I, I think you know the biggest challenge here, and we've discussed it in many different ways, is just connecting the community. How do you connect the community and provide them the services, whether it be education, or, or just keeping the community in, in 
friendly order so they don't have to call? How do you do all that? And it really starts with having a, a good baseline of um, connectivity to the community. Great comments, Michael. We, we will now uh, start our lightning round. And um, Al, why don't we go in the same order and have you lead us off? with uh, your quick observation on any key point that you'd like to leave the audience with. Well, yeah. I mean, so I'd like to sort of leave the audience as well as, as our esteemed guest with some thoughts I've had in working with New York City in reference to proliferating broadband, um, particularly in underserved areas or non-affluent zip codes. Uh, in your municipal area, in suburban area, in, in your in your rural area. One of the things we did in New York was, was to create uh, sort of broadband opportunity zones. And these zones were, were looked at as those that uh, were not affluent zip codes that were definitely underserved um, with broadband services and start removing um, or actually enhancing some of the ways of which some of those broadband providers would actually be attracted to providing services to, uh, for lack of a better word, the outer boroughs uh, of your municipality. We can reduce, we reduced franchise fees, we reduced tariff fees, we made more accessibility to streetlight poles and wood utility poles. We, we, we um, enhanced the provision for aesthetic overview in reference to the deployment of, of not just uh, 5G, but uh, 4G, CBRS, millimeter wave services, and any wireless component, uh, what we were looking to do. We were also looking at those broadband opportunity zones uh, to attract more um, uh, fiber conduit in the ground by being able to have a, sort of a revenue share opportunity. Uh, and so creating those types of incentives by understanding where your broadband opportunity zones are by taking a look at where the most underserved areas in your city or your region are and why that is the case can also drive you to now create new incentives for those third party operators who have traditionally not served those areas. So I, I would sort of leave the audience with uh, taking a look at your own unique ways of creating your own broadband opportunity zones to drive those third party operators to serve those less than affluent zip codes in your area. Great parting comment, Al, thank you. David, we've got a few minutes before the uh, hour. Can you give us your quick uh, thoughts as well? Yeah, so um, I'll be very brief. So Westminster's focused a lot on fiber today. Um, my, my big plea, I guess, for, for kind of um, UK um, connectivity is um, we have really poor data around mobile connectivity within the UK. The challenge is different than that of fiber. Um, there is a coverage point, uh, but something even more important within our cities is the capacity of that network to um, provide a positive experience for users. Um, so I would just encourage there to be greater focus on addressing um, mobile capacity problems um, in cities. Um, in a similar way, we, we tackle fiber. How can we get build up those really good quality data sets so we understand that problem and start um, kind of addressing um, kind of um, mobile not spots in cities? Because I think it does solve real problems. Um, safety is big is a big one, especially women out at night. How can in, ensuring good mobile connectivity make sure that they can remain connected, remain um, safe if they are um, navigating the city on their own? So I just stress the importance of um, some of the cellular um, capacity problems that our cities face as well. Thank you, David. Great advice. Aaron. Yeah, uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone. I, I took notes. I'm very excited about what I've heard today. I would also like to just take a moment and highlight the work that the city council and in collaboration with our city's IT department under the leadership of Kim LeGrew is doing in this space and really trying to tackle the challenges of the digital divide head on. You know, we 
have a smart cities focus within our utilities committee. We have advisors like Clint and Denton's helping guide us in these spaces. And I love that these are the conversations we're having now. And it's not great that it took a pandemic to get us here, but we are. And I think it means that I can also be very optimistic about where we are headed. So thank you all. And it's been a pleasure being here today. Thanks, Clint. Thank you so much, Aaron, and, and uh, great comments. And we have, uh, Michael, if you would um, close this portion of our presentation, and then we will have uh, Steve close us out. Well, thank you, Clinton, and thank you all for allowing me to be here today. Again, I'm just going to echo the two great uh, presenters I had before me, the same, same sediments. But look, connectivity is critical, whether it be fiber, wireless. I think us sharing and getting together and communicating is critical. I wish more of these type of events would take place uh, to get more ideas out there, more education out there. Um, there's going to be a lot of challenges with connectivity in the coming years, um, just having the one, the bandwidth in, in the areas for density purposes. Uh, secondly, we have a lot of rural activity and rural areas that need connectivity. And then we have the inner core of cities, which also need that connectivity. So I think if we keep sharing and keep working together, uh, there's so many opportunities out there that great things can happen. And really in order for us to have safer communities, we need to make sure that people have opportunities. And so really it's all based on connectivity. Thank you, Michael. I couldn't agree with you more. And, uh, you know, there's been so much uh, original thought on this panel. I think it probably would be a good idea for our think tank to come back to this discussion and uh, maybe even do so on a fairly regular basis in coordination with uh, WBA, who has been uh, a great partner for this discussion. But um, I will. Um, I just want to uh, express how impressed I am with the quality of the conversation of this panel and our friend Rob Schwartz uh, in his fireside chat. So, Steve, would you like to have the last word? Yes, thank you, Clint. Uh, I'm going to share my screen because I'm. Whilst you were actually doing the hard work, I was fortunate enough that I could take notes, and I thought, okay, I just try to put some of this. Some of the comments that uh, the panelists made on on a screen uh, on, you know, and uh, as well. So, um, just closing remarks. Uh, some of the key observations that I noted. Uh, so, Rob, I think the, you started off the importance of clean energy and sustainability, uh, and what, for example, Enterix is doing in terms of leveraging pri private wireless uh, to help you know try and fix some of this issue. Al, you shared your insights on how U.S. cities are leveraging their assets, the importance of understanding where people are, are served or underserved, as it may well be, uh, how the FCC is raising the bar for funding programs as well. Uh, David um, from Westminster, um, it sounds like you know connectivity has been embraced across the infrastructure for a very long time. Uh, you've navigated through some of the legal complexities in terms of you know connecting properties. Uh, impress, you know, 90% of social housing has full fibre. Um, Digital inclusion progress sounds like you've been doing very well in that over the last three years, uh, halving it year on year down to 2%, uh, I understand. Uh, you're evaluating open roaming to improve the user experience uh, for citizens of Westminster over the Wi-Fi network, but also to expand their coverage across the borough, or across the, of the council and also across London. Uh, also, you'd like to address mobile not spots uh, as well. Aaron uh, from New Orleans, um, Obviously, a yeah, digital divide is a key issue. Twenty-nine percent, scarily, are without consistent access to broadband, and three percent rely on public Wi-Fi or open networks. Um, and how the correlation between the number of households without internet largely tracks with households living in poverty. Uh, Michael from Las Vegas. Um, I think the challenge of providing or increasing connectivity for the education, workforce, and living life. Uh, what you're experiencing in Vegas in terms of a mass influx of people for short periods of time and a strong focus on hospitality and, and automation. Um, and then the look at AI uh, and other applications uh, and how private cellular uh, was launched during the pandemic for individuals without connectivity uh, for limited bandwidth as well and its education first approach as well. Um, apologies, I think you experienced the uh, 
from working from home what that can mean sometimes and people not understanding when you're on a conference call so apologies for that minor interruption um i want to also just uh share i think uh, you know some of the the wba's events to your point um clint i think yeah definitely a good idea to get on some type of regular forum uh or some you know you have your think tank we also have our congresses here i'd like to make an open open invite to all of the panelists uh to be at our next uh set of congresses uh in dallas in june and also in in paris in october um i also want to share some news hot off the press uh so something that we announced um earlier in the week uh so with a few of our members so sin and global reach technology and also one of the uh the telcos over here cult technology uh they have launched um a, you can see this uh this outdoor unit uh, on the right hand side and from uh, further afield uh, on the left hand side so this unit is actually broadcasting wi-fi it supports the open roaming technology standard the area this is in is in shoreditch so it's quite a, a busy business area uh, as well as where a lot of people tend to do a lot of sort of socializing as well so if you uh, you know you have a a, a a device with an open roaming profile you'll be able to roam close to this uh, to this unit and connect seamlessly as well okay um and it doesn't cost a thing uh i think that's important to note as well okay so yeah so i think just to close out um just sharing some of the work that the WBA is doing. Uh, Michael, towards the end there, in your sort of lightning round, you mentioned rural connectivity. Uh, that's been a big focus for the WBA in, in recent years as well. We developed a white paper on that topic. Um, if anybody would like to get involved in any of the work we're doing, feel free to reach out and we can share more information. But I think it's been a fantastic pa uh, kind of powerhouse of, uh, of places, uh, of, uh, of cities, as well as with it, Rob from Enteric. So thank you very much. And we, uh, we will be, there will be another installment of the uh, of the Connected Communities Forums and what we've been doing here with Denton later in the year as well. Thank you. That was such a brilliant and succinct uh, summary, Steve. I think I'm going to bring you in to our law firm to give our advocates a uh, tutorial on how to uh, say it um, with great uh, emphasis and, and, and short duration. Beautifully done. And um, I am going to uh, just ask you to join me in giving an ovation to this really wonderful, wonderful panel. Thank you so much. Beautifully done. And uh, Wishing everyone a great day. Take care.